This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Odawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize and contemporary ties in our efforts towards decolonizing history. And we thank the indi indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. The acknowledgement of land, labor, and ongoing systemic racism included here as a way to show respect to indigenous communities are meaningless without action. So we ask that as you navigate the world around you, that you watch for and insist upon correction of systemic and institutionalized racist practices in your communities. This may include stereotyping or the absence of representation, uh, and it includes inequities in institutions such as education, housing, health, law, and commerce. I also want to recognize the space we're inhabiting together. And although I really hoped we would all be in the same physical space, you are now joining us from your own um, private or semi-private spaces. But as you listen to Dr. Garland Thompson, I hope you will be conscious of the ways in which you inhabit space and take advantage of this opportunity um, to move, to sit, to stand, to lie down, to stim, to tweet, to take notes, or whatever else helps you to focus and imbibe um, the important information that Dr. Garland Thompson will be sharing with us. It is an honor to get to introduce Dr. Rosemary Garland Thompson, a visionary leader on and for disability ethics, both within and outside academic settings. Dr. Garland Thompson has led and participated in events sponsored by the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights, the U.S. Department of State, the Smithsonian Institution, the Lancet, the Vatican, the Kennedy Center for Ethics, the de Young Museum, the Brochet Foundation, and the Federal Reserve Bank. Currently, Dr. Garland Thompson is Professor Emerita of English and Bioethics at Emory University. also Chief Project Advisor for the NEH-supported project, The Art of Flourishing, Conversations on Disability and Technology. She was also a 2020 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar, and she joins us as a Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar. She's the author and editor of numerous scholarly books and works of public scholarship. Most recently, she edited, co-edited About Us, Essays from the Disability Series of the New York Times. In the introduction to her 1997 book, Extraordinary Bodies, Figuring Physical Disability in American Culture and Literature, excuse me, Dr. Garland Thompson defines disability as, quote, a representation, a cultural interpretation of physical transformation or configuration, and a comparison of bodies that structures social relations and institutions. Disability, then, is the attribution of corporeal deviance, not so much a property of bodies as a product of cultural rules about what bodies should be or do, end quote. Tonight's presentation is a culmination of the academic and activist work that has defined her career. Building a world that includes disability will explore our understanding of disability and how that term is defined by history, culture, politics, and aesthetics. <coughs> Excuse me. It also asks us to rethink how the world currently includes disability and how we can build a world that will, more, that will allow more of us to share and live together and be better for us all. I'd like to thank Tim Pogochar and the Chi of Ohio chapter of Phi Beta Kappa at BGSU. Additional financial support was provided by the Office of Accessibility Services, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, the Department of Philosophy, the School of Cultural and Critical Studies, and the Honors Learning Community. Excuse me. I also want to recognize the labor of all of the people who've helped prepare this room and the technology for us and who will clean up Fs after us after we leave. And I'd like to thank conference and event services, accessibility services, our marketing colleagues, and the sign language interpreters and closed captioners who are helping us tonight to ensure more people can participate in this important conversation. I'd also like to thank former ICSGA Carrie Hanlon, 
and current ICS graduate assistants, Joe Alot, Elia, Renee Ayala, and Stanley Owasu, and the other ICS graduate assistants and interns from several semesters who've put their energy into making this event a success. This has been de delayed a few times, but it's worth the wait. And if, uh, if you'd like to keep up with other events like this and are interested in ICS, you can find us on social media. You found the live stream, so you found our website. Um, so you can also email us, ics at bgsu.edu, if you'd like to keep abreast of more uh, of our events or follow us on social media. And with that, I will get out of the way and present to you Dr. Rosemary Gartland Thompson. Thank you, Jolie, for that um, generous and kind introduction. Uh, and to the entire Bowling Green State uh, University community, many of whom I have met today and last night and worked with, um, and for the flexibility and good spirit uh, that has characterized the entire enterprise of my visit here. So I'm really honored to be here uh, with you all. And I echo all of the thanks that Jolie offered, uh, which I won't necessarily repeat, uh, but I am particularly grateful for all of you, whomever you are out there, <laughs> uh, participating in the community event, really, of the knowledge building enterprise that Phi Beta Kappa, and Bowling Green State University and all the members of these communities uh, across time and place, uh, all of the things that have been contributed. So I'm really delighted to be here and impressed with all of our flexibility. So uh, to move on quickly, hello, Tim, <laughs> to uh, my lecture. And um, thank you very much for your patience in this. Um, I have designed my presentation to uh, be presented in multiple formats. So one format is my voice and in front of my uh, live audience, which is two people here in this lovely auditorium this evening, uh, but also a uh, online or virtual or video uh, and audio recording of this lecture. And uh, there is also a PowerPoint uh, which accompanies this, which is a visual and textual representation of uh, my work. And that can be made available, uh, either the recording of it or the um, a PDF of the um, PowerPoint if you want to contact any of the hosts here. So the principle is that communication and learning can take place in multiple formats. And so I've tried to illustrate as many of them uh, here as uh, might be available tonight. I think we're going to have somewhere out here uh, an ASL interpreter as well. So um, the challenge is ours. <clears throat> okay, as Jolie mentioned, the title of my presentation this evening is Building a World That Includes Disability. So I'm going to begin by a summary, sometimes called an executive summary, to give you an idea, uh, a, a kind of uh, handhold, if you will, of the presentation. So I'm going to be doing four things in the four parts of this presentation. First, I'll be offering you some non-medical definitions of disability. This will become clear, I hope, as we discuss the first part. Second, I will be um, introducing you to some of the cultural contributions made by people with disabilities across time and space, largely within the Western tradition, which is that which I am familiar with. Uh, Third, disabilities evolution during the civil rights movement, which will be a bit of a history lesson about the development of disability rights and disability practice and policy. Again, with the Western orientation, particularly that of the United States. And finally, 
<coughs> I'll talk about what I call taking disability further, the potential of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I rather like the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's uh, something that kind of rolls off the tongue comfortably, DEI. And I would like to promote it as an ethical initiative that is institutionalized in higher education and in many institutions um, worldwide and includes disability um, and includes disability in a capacious and ethical way. So I'm going to begin with a a slogan, a kind of call and response that comes from disability studies. And that is the concept that disability is everywhere once you know how to find it. So if disability is everywhere once you know how to find it, let's talk first about what is disability. And as I promised, I'll offer you some definitions. These are my own definitions. They may be a little ponderous, but I wanna be very deliberate in uh, excavating possible meanings and potential meanings of disability for you here tonight. So the first definition of disability I'm offering is that the human variations we think of as disabilities are part of the human condition and they occur in every life and family and they are a theme in all art and culture. So as I suggested, this is an elaboration of the idea that disability is everywhere. Second, the lived experiences of disability give people and communities opportunities for expression, creativity, resourcefulness, relationships, and flourishing. And I'll be illustrating this point with the content of my presentation. Third, Disability is a set of stories, and this is perhaps the most novel, the most unique aspect of my particular take on disability, and that is that disability is a set of stories, of narratives that we receive through culture and through acculturation, and that we remake. And these stories are about the human variations, I like that term, that scientific medicine considers to be disability, disease, illness, and body-mind differences. So you will see that I'm focusing on culture and art and literature in my presentation this evening and my definitions of disability. So I have said that disability is everywhere once we know how to find it. And I'm following this up with the question of where do we find disability? And I want to suggest that we find disability in many places, all of culture, across all of time and space. But I'm going to highlight four particular arenas uh, where we find disability. First is literature. And I'm an English professor, so this is uh, my preference to talk about this, but also in performance, in art, and in design. Disability, I want to suggest as I follow up about where we find disability, crosses all aesthetics, themes, and cultures. So I'm elaborating here on my claim that disability is everywhere, across lives, across space, across time, across culture. So I've suggested that disability is that which we can find. And I'm going to follow up with the idea of what does finding disability do? What is the purpose? of finding disability. And I want to suggest that finding disability, and we'll do that together this evening, is an opportunity to explore, to redefine, and to make new stories about what it means to be human. And I'll be elaborating 
on this relationship between the human variations that we think of as disabilities and what it means to be human. Finding disability helps us understand how human communities make and unmake the human variations that we think of as disabilities. So disability is not a static state of being, but rather it is a dynamic lived experience that comes to all families and all people, as I've suggested, and that shifts over time and space throughout human lives and across human communities. So the categories that I mentioned, we'll start first with literature and the performing arts, and we'll begin with what is in some ways the founding narrative of Western culture, and that is the story of Oedipus, Oedipus the King, which is a classic tragedy written by Sophocles. And if you recall, of course, the story of Oedipus both begins and ends with disability. It is bookended with disability. Oedipus is put out on the mountain with his ankles bound together, with his feet bound together, left to be collected up or to die out on the mountaintop uh, as a threat, of course, uh, to his family. And this was part of the, uh, of the story of Oedipus. And of course, the story of Oedipus ends, and I'm showing an image here of an actor from 1896, uh, showing Oedipus tearing at his clothes after he has stabbed out his own eyes. Of course, Greek tragedy is, uh, is very dramatic and, and fairly gruesome. And so the story of Oedipus, this founding story, begins with disability, it ends with disability. And this is a way of thinking about the cultural meanings of disability and how fundamental they are to Western culture. Um, to move through the tradition of Western culture, we have John Milton, the poet who composed Paradise Lost when he was blind. We have here a cover of Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, Beethoven, uh, the uh, arguably most important composer of uh, Western modernity and Western culture, is deaf when he writes his most important symphonies. Um, in American literature, which of course is my own field, the most important, the most canonical novel of the 19th century is Herman, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, which turns on a protagonist, Captain Ahab, who has a peg leg, who has a disability. In the 19th century, William Faulkner's novel, The Sound and the Fury, again, understood as being the uh, premier canonical novel of the 20th century turns on a protagonist, Benji Thompson, who uh, is a person with a cognitive disability. So again, disability is central to the plots and the character of these important and canonical narratives of uh, Western culture, and in this case, uh, in particular, American literature. Um, in terms of life stories or life writing, what we might think of as memoir or autobiography, again, disability plays a very important role in life stories. I'm showing here two examples of what we sometimes call slave stories or slave narratives, uh, the life uh, narr incidents in the life of a slave girl uh, by Harriet Jacobs, and of course, Frederick Douglass's narrative uh, uh, of an American slave. Again, both stories turn on uh, the physical disabilities that uh, enslavement visited upon the enslaved, and of course, of course, um, upon all people eventually. So again, disability can be found in these canonical works of life writing and literature. Uh, more recently, I'm showing here uh, two covers of books, which are collections of contemporary people with disabilities. One is called About Us, and the other is called Disability Visibility. So these are very teachable, I should say, um, and very uh, varied uh, inter 
uh, sectional kinds of analyses of disability. So I'd highly recommend both of these books as well. So in performance, we have various genres of disabled performers. I'm showing here three images of um, uh, performers who are blind African-American uh, piano players. Uh, first uh, is so-called Blind Tom. This is Thomas Wiggins, a late 19th century uh, blind performer uh, on the piano. And of course, more recently, we have J uh, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder, again, who are performers from this very particular genre of disability uh, musicians and entertainers and performers um, in opera. Um, I'm showing here two images of the uh, very important folk opera, Porgy and Bess by um, Ira Gershwin. Uh, and in the first image I have from 1959, the actor Sidney Poitier, who is playing the lead role of Porgy. Porgy is a disabled man, a crippled man. He's called the called the goat cart man. And it's very interesting that um, Sidney Portier in 1959 plays a porgy down on his knees uh, in 1959. But in 2011, we have a very different version of porgy. This is an upright porgy embracing Bess, who is Audra McDonald here in um, a version of the Gershwin's uh, porgy and Bess, uh, which really re-scripts the idea of the uh, choreography of a disabled, a crippled so-called uh, porgy. So again, the disability, porgy's disability is central to the plot of this uh, opera, folk opera, American folk opera. Um, uh, another celebrity, uh, one of our most important actors, and by our, I mean uh, an actor with a disability, is Peter Dinklage. I'm showing here two images of Dinklage on the right. He is uh, playing a character uh, that I can't pronounce the name of very effectively in the television program Game of Thrones. And um, on the left, we have uh, Peter Dinklage, who is also in a wonderful film I'd highly recommend called The Station Agent. If you haven't had a chance to see it, it's really a wonderful film. Uh, showing uh, Dinklage here on the cover of Esquire magazine. And he's, um, he's a person of small stature, a person with dwarfism. And he's got a really kind of cool haircut here and a really nice suit. And uh, Maureen Dowd, uh, the columnist for the Washington Post uh, and sometimes New York Times uh, did a profile of uh, Dinklage. I think it was in the New Yorker in which she called him America's first dwarf heartthrob. And I thought she was actually really right. And that's who we have on the cover of Esquire magazine here. So follow Peter Dinklage. Um, in terms of uh, performance, uh, we have a whole genre of disability dance, and I'll show you a few images. Uh, dancers with disabilities have had the opportunity to completely redefine the genres of dance in which they participate in because their bodies are configured in ways that make available to them new movement vocabularies, movement vocabularies that are uh, extre extremely innovative. So here's an example of Leroy Moore uh, jo Jr., who is a poet, and he has created a genre of dance called Crip Hop, which of course is a play on the idea of hip hop, uh, Crip being K-R-I-P, Crip Hop, um, which is a very um, interesting new genre of performance. Uh, that uh, Moore has launched and is defining. He's working at UCLA doing this now. Um, the more traditional form of disability dance now is uh, dancers who dance uh, on wheels instead of dancing on legs. And I'm showing here an image uh, from Kinetic Light uh, of Alice Shepard and Laurel Lawson, who are two wheelchair dancers. And it has been suggested that the wheelchair has introduced into the costuming of dance uh, something completely innovative 
that uh, has not taken place since the introduction of the toe shoe into uh, dance uh, costuming. In art and sculpture, and I'll spend a little time on that, we have disability again everywhere. I'm working on a project myself on uh, an ethics of care that is uh, begins with uh, Michelangelo's uh, statue of the Pieta, that is to say, uh, the figure of Mary, the mother of Jesus, holding the crucified body of uh, Jesus on her lap. And this particular choreography of uh, mourning, of lament, which is the Pieta, has been repeated over and over and over again in the um, choreography of iconography uh, throughout Western culture. And I'm studying this as an elevation of care ethics to uh, the um, level of the sacred. And here are some images from this. This is a Latter-day Pieta from 2007. The uh, Australian uh, sculptor Sam Jinks has done this very realistic Pieta, which takes Michelangelo's Pieta with the mother, the mother of Jesus, um, and the body of the crucified Jesus, and rewrites this, putting an ordinary man in the position of the holder of the body and a very, very old person uh, that is almost unidentifiable in terms of gender identity, um, draped over the lap in this, this choreography of care that uh, is part of the sacred choreography of the Pieta. And there are many, many Pietas that I'm not going to show you all of them, of course, that have followed in this tradition, elevating care ethics and the ethics of care, care of the body, to uh, the uh, status of the sacred through its references to uh, the Christian tradition of the Pieta. Again, disability appears in all art. Uh, so this is an example from John Singer Sargent uh, from 1918 of what we might think of as protest art. So this is called Gassed, and it shows uh, a number of blind soldiers. And of course, war is part of what our human culture has done to make and remake disability. So war creates disabilities and then it also creates the treatments and the rehabilitation and the technologies uh, that accommodate the disabilities that the war itself creates so there's a a really interesting and in some sense perverse circle that war creates in making and unmaking disability and uh, this portrait uh, called gassed that uh, sergeant does um, is a testimony to this making and remaking of uh, disability that war accomplishes. Um, the late works of many artists, I mentioned Milton and I mentioned Beethoven to you, but late works uh, of all of artists across all genres, of course, are inflected by disability because, of course, disability comes to all of us later in life. And here's an example of Claude Monet's Water Lilies, part of his late works. And of course, as Monet ages, he becomes more and more blind. And as he produces his art, the works that he does become more and more visually fuzzy as his vision actually changes. And so this is imagined not as an artistic devolution, but rather as an artistic evolution so that his later works are fuzzier and more impressionistic because of course, this is what Monet is actually seeing uh, in his late works. Um, there are many, of course, other disabled artists. This is an example of Frida Kahlo, who uh, is an artist with a disability who uh, in her self-portraits uh, shows her disability and the apparatuses of disability, the equipment of disability, um, as well as what I call the costuming of disability. And so I'm showing here two uh, of the self-portraits of um, 
Frida Kahlo. So she has in many of her portraits, the characteristic corset and brace uh, in this uh, kind of magical realism portrait on the right. We actually see the uh, spinal um, apparatuses that she had inserted in her body. Uh, and the corset that she had to wear, as well as, of course, her characteristic unibrow. And this is one of the, I think, the only portrait, uh, self-portrait that um, Callow does in which she shows herself in a wheelchair on the left. Um, I'm showing here an image of a contemporary sculptor, uh, Judith Scott, uh, 1943. Judith Scott is born. She is born with Down syndrome. Uh, she uh, never speaks in life. She's understood as having a cognitive disability. Her sister takes her to some kind of a workshop, a craft uh, activity in uh, Northern California, where she starts taking the fiber that's available there and wrapping it. And she wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and made sculptures uh, that now have become extremely important. She's understood as uh, perhaps the most important uh, woman American sculptor. Uh, and she uh, died in 2005. Uh, so this is a photograph of her uh, touching, holding uh, one of her rap sculptures. And what's really interesting is that she never, because she didn't speak, she never reflected at all on her work, but produced it over and over and over and over again. Uh, uh, artist who works with disability. This is Christine's son, Kim, who is a deaf sound artist. And she is a sign language using deaf artist who explores the relationship between deafness and sound. And it's very interesting that she does this work because the stereotype of deafness is that deaf people have no relationship with sound. And what she does, does in her work is bring forward the relationship between deafness and deaf people and sound. And she's shown here uh, doing some kind of a, uh, a really interesting piece of sound art in which uh, uh, paint is translated into sound in some mechanical way. Um, this is a portrait, a self-portrait, done by Riva Lehrer, who is one of the most well-known uh, disabled portrait artists. She paints portraits of people with disabilities. Um, and this is one of her self uh, portraits. It's really very beautiful, I think. She was born with spina bifida. And um, she, uh, in this self portrait is showing her own back um, as a kind of testimony to the reality of her own physicality uh, in this really quite beautiful, I think think, um, self-portrait, uh, where she is immersed in a, um, a kind of baptismal pool. So follow Rivalera's work. She has a new uh, memoir out called Gollum Girl, uh, which is really quite wonderful as well that I'd highly recommend. So I'm going to also uh, talk a little bit here about accessible or inclusive design, which uh, is sometimes called design for disability, sometimes it's called universal design. It is an enterprise that um, involves completely rebuilding and remaking the world from small instruments to large scale instruments to the rebuilding of cities to accommodate disability and to create an accessible designed and built environment. And so often we don't think about inclusive design as being part of arts and culture, but I would invite us to think about this technology design from individual technologies to, as I said, the built and designed uh, buildings. The building that we're in right now, of course, is designed to be accessible. That's a federal mandate, but it has transformed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, who we think of as our uh, public that we spend time with in shared space. 
So um, some examples here, this is an example of a prosthetic leg that is designed to be functional, but primarily designed to be aesthetically beautiful. Uh, the alternative limb project often uh, bedazzles and bejewels prosthetic devices. Uh, older prosthetic devices in a pre-civil and pre-disability rights movement were designed to be hidden. And now prosthetic uh, devices uh, are designed to be seen. They're designed as aesthetic um, and athletic, often uh, implements. So it's a whole new world in that respect. Uh, wheelchairs, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about wheelchairs a bit later. This is the uh, engineer at MIT, very well-known engineer and prosthetic designer, who himself is a double amputee. His name is Hugh Hare, and he has developed legs, and he's shown here uh, with his fancy legs. Um, that uh, do all sorts of things. He, he has invented or designed, I guess I should say, running legs for athletes um, and many other kinds of legs. Uh, this is Kathy D. Woods. She is a fashion designer. She is a person of small stature, again, uh, depending on how you want to call it, or a person with dwarfism. And she designs uh, clothes for small adults because uh, as a small person, she was very frustrated by not being able to find professional clothes uh, because she is a professional woman that were not clothes for children. So she has uh, opened up an entire uh, line of bespoke fashion for um, people with disabilities, particularly small adults. Um, this is uh, a wonderful example of some of the inclusive design uh, or the accessible design. Uh, these are called air, uh, ear chairs, and they are exaggerated versions of wing chairs where the wings create a space that amplifies sound and thus makes communication between people uh, more effective through the use of these enhancement devices that are these beautiful chairs that I'm showing here face to face. Um, this is a tactile watch for blind people. Again, there are many ways of being able accessing meaning. Um, sorry, access to meaning, visual access to meaning where quite accustomed to. Tactile access to meaning and information is less available and less usual for people, but this tactile watch that can tell you what time it is by touching it is actually quite a beautiful uh, implement. Wheeled mobility, as I suggested, has transformed the uh, way we go about our business um, in life, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but wheelchairs and walkers had previously been medical equipment. They were pieces of equipment that were designed for sick people, and they were designed to be uh, used and to be um, uh, uh, enlivened by other people. In other words, they were designed to be pushed. But now, of course, with the new designs that we have for wheelchairs, and um, I'm showing also a walker here, all sorts of wheeled mobility has been transformed uh, so that it is usable for a wide variety of people outside of medical settings. All you have to do is go to a big international airport like Detroit or any of these large international airports and you see the contextualization, the context dependence of disability. So someone who is not a wheelchair user at home or at work may certainly become a wheelchair user in the environment uh, of something like an airport. And of course the airports are covered with these um, really utility vehicles that um, are uh, wheelchairs. I'm going to end this section with uh, a beautiful image of a ramp. This is a helical ramp um, at the Ed Roberts campus um, in Berkeley, California. And this gives you a little bit of a history 
of ramps. So in 1968 in the United States, and I'll talk a little bit about this a bit later in the history of the disability rights movement and the transformation of the built environment, we have the Architectural Barriers Act, which says you need, if you're going to get federal money, you meaning anybody in any institution, to make your spaces available and accessible to people with disabilities. And of course, architects and designers had no idea how to do that in 1968. And so ramps were strapped on, bolted on to the fronts of buildings, and they were thought to ruin the aesthetic and, and uh, economic value of buildings. But now, of course, design has evolved to the point where ramps and elevated paths are at the very center of design. So this is a perfect example of a beautiful red helical lamp, uh, ramp, not lamp, ramp that is in the very center of a building. And so the act of ascending in this building using this ramp is not something that is hidden, but something that is central to the design and the constitution and the ethics of the building itself. So access, I want to suggest, in other words, getting the opportunity to be somewhere is everywhere once you know how to look for it. So I said disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it. I wanna suggest that access is everywhere once you know how to look for it. So access is not often as evident as the red helical ramp that I just showed you in Berkeley. Often access, whether it's a ramp, whether it's a door push, whether it's, um, a tactile watch. These forms of access in the designed and built environment often do not call attention to themselves. We don't notice them when things are going smoothly, but what they create, of course, is a particular kind of public participation, a particular kind of public that all of these accessible designs and implements make possible. So we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about access and the history of a built accessible environment together here in the rest of my presentation. So we'll begin, of course, with the international symbol of access, which begins, as I suggested, in 1968, when this stick figure wheelchair user, of course, is designed. This is a very static, of course, figure of someone in uh, a stick figure in a wheelchair. And then the more dynamic 2010 uh, version of this emblem, this symbol that directs people to accessible pathways. Uh, people know where to look for this. Once they see this sign, they know that there are ways you can take your bicycle or your stroller or your rolling suitcase or your wheelchair or your skateboard that you can follow these signs anywhere and have an accessible path into the public world. And so this more dynamic uh, emblem, which of course is quite symbol, which is quite controversial, suggests the change between 1968 and 2010 of the agency that people with disabilities um, are imagined as uh, being able to have um, in the 21st century. So a little history lesson here, as I promised you, how do we get from segregation to inclusion? And what is then what I call the path from patient to citizen that we have all undergone as a result of the disability rights movement, which is part of the larger human and civil rights movement, which begins, and this is a very fast romp through history, uh, in 1948 and extends to the present. And I'm showing here an image of Eleanor Roosevelt, who is holding the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which is an international covenant, which begins, it comes out of World War II and out of the uh, ethical violations uh, in the Holocaust and in World War II in general. And in 19... 48, the United Nation begins with these declarations of human rights. 
and they extend throughout the 20th century. There are many of these conventions or treaties or declaration on human rights. This is simply the first. Uh, there is also much activism, if you will, and culture making in the United States and elsewhere along the way. Um, I'm showing here simply a picture of Helen Keller, a very well-known uh, public intellectual. She is a deaf blind woman who goes to Radcliffe College in, uh, I think it's the 1940s. Um, and she uh, lived and worked because she was educated, because she learned to read, to read Braille, she learned to speak. She uh, was able to go to school in a way that most disabled people are able to go to school now. At that time, it was very difficult for anyone with a disability or certainly even anyone who's a woman to be able to get um, higher education, but Helen Keller was able to do this for a variety of reasons. So she's been one of the really important leaders um, in the disability rights movement. The disability rights movement uh, comes along in the mid 20th century with the whole compilation of rights movements, the women's movement, the black civil rights movement, the LGBTQ movement, as it was called, uh, the uh, various ethnic movements, indigenous movements, and the disability rights movement. These all come together and these all start and develop in the mid 20th century. And I'm showing here a really wonderful image of a protest, of course, move a protest march um, uh, probably from the 1970s, uh, in which we have uh, a whole lot of people uh, uh, with disabilities in their wheelchairs marching, carrying a banner. And the banner uh, is a quote from Martin Luther King that says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I love this image because I think it suggests what we think of now as the intersection the mid 20th century, which gave us the uh, diverse world that we live in and participate in now. A few other touchstone pieces. This is a book called No Pity by Joseph Shapiro, which is a history of the disability rights movement, which is a really important movement, again, a lesser known movement. So I'd recommend that. And of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which comes in 1990, and it is the most capacious piece of disability rights legislation that mandates uh, accommodations and an accessible built environment for people with disabilities across all institutions. So the legislation begins in 1968 and it culminates really in the United States in 1990 with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, which grants this is the path from a patient to citizen and the uh, legislative and policy path that I want to illustrate here. On an international level, we have to continue Eleanor Roosevelt's work with the um, Declaration of Human Rights, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. In 2006, we have the Convention or the Declaration of uh, Human Rights uh, for Persons with Disabilities. And this is a really important international treaty, an international covenant that many, many nations have signed on to, which is much more capacious than uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, but it does different kinds of things. The United States is not uh, a part of this treaty uh, in part because the United States simply doesn't sign on to UN treaties uh, in general. And that's, that's another a set of um, questions we can talk about. Um, I wanted to uh, show you part of the discourse of bioethics, uh, which is a field I'm participating in uh, now, and some of the uh, issues that are uh, before us now in bioethics, and that is the ethics of medical uh, scientific development uh, of technologies and practices. 
And so disability is at the center, of course, of uh, most all medical technologies and uh, most all medical practices. Um, and this is simply one uh, strand of conversation that I'm uh, presenting here. And this is the uh, cover of the Atlantic Magazine's 2020 uh, issue in December. Uh, which is called The Last Children of Down Syndrome. And it's a story uh, about uh, families uh, and people with Down Syndrome in Denmark. And the author of this uh, article uh, read that um, some of the Nordic countries, Denmark, uh, as well as Iceland, had announced in 2020 that they had ended uh, Down syndrome, that there were no more, uh, there was no more Down syndrome, that this was a disease that had been eliminated. And so the um, author of this, uh, the journalist that wrote this story, uh, wondered what that meant for people with Down syndrome and families with people with Down syndrome in some of these countries. And so she began uh, to research this really interesting article about um, communities and families with Down syndrome in Denmark. So I highly recommend it. And of course, this is one of the crucial uh, bioethical questions is how we think about disability in relation to um, uh, prenatal testing and prenatal termination and other interventions such as gene editing uh, and um, other kinds of selection, uh, reproductive uh, processes. We sometimes call this in a trivializing way that questions about uh, designer babies, ethical questions about designer babies. I don't like that term very well because I think it kind of trivializes something that's much more uh, important than that. But anyway, that's one of the areas in bioethics that is um, very current, uh, especially now, of course, with the new uh, uh, status of abortion uh, after the Roe decision. So these questions are coming forward all the time uh, now, very currently. I wanted to leave you with a definition of disability, another one uh, that reflects the political and social definitions that I have suggested. And again, that is disabled people are a politically created group of qualified individuals. Now, qualified individuals is a term that's used in US policy. You have to qualify to be a person with a disability. If any of you uh, receive accommodations, either um, instructional accommodations or institutional accommodations of some sort, you have to qualify as a person with a disability in order to get those um, accommodations. Um, and so that's an important part of what it means to be a person with a disability in the United States. So this is a politically created group of qualified individuals who are protected against discrimination. That's what civil rights legislation does. It protects individuals in groups from discrimination by civil rights legislation and accorded the right to request reasonable accommodations. This is what it means to be a person with a disability in the United States, to qualify, to request accommodations, and to object to discrimination. That's how disability rights legislation and logic works in the United States. It works differently in other countries, but this is a good definition, a legal and political definition of disability, which is different from the cultural and social definitions that I offered you at the beginning. But I wanted to give you the disability rights history. So in conclusion, I want to uh, suggest what disability inclusion can do. So accessible design, an accessible designed and built environment that we've looked at briefly, and disability 
cultural consciousness, that is to say, to know the culture and history of people with disabilities, to know that Frida Kahlo was a person with a disability is one example. They create this knowledge and this built and designed environment creates inclusion, and it does so by changing who we share our world with. If you think about it, you in this educational institution would not have before the mid 20th century ever been able to go to school with somebody who was a wheelchair user. You would not have been able to share a bus with someone with a wheelchair. You would not have been able to share a train probably with someone who used a white cane because they were blind. And that was because the built environment did not allow many people with different kinds of disabilities to enter into it, to be into public shared space. So part of inclusion is literally people with disabilities and non-disabled people being able to literally be next to one another, to get to know one another, to share employment and educational opportunities, to share the public space. And that's what has changed tremendously since the mid 20th century in the United States and other uh, rich nations. So what can we do to increase this disability inclusion that I've been describing? And these are my recommendations to you in your institutions, to you individually, and also, of course, to the larger communities that uh, we all inhabit and lead. So one thing is that we can know disability history, and I've offered you a little of that. You can know disability culture, I've offered you a little of that. And you can know disability justice, and I've offered you a little of that. You can know disability technologies, and you can use the accommodations that are legally available to you as a qualified person with a disability. So know what the laws are and know what the accommodations are. You can practice disability inclusion in the spaces in which you inhabit, in the workforce, the workplace, and the marketplace. And of course, in your schools, which of course are your own workplace now for those of us who are students. And you can be aware of how inclusion operates. You can be aware of your own capacity, whether you identify as disabled or non-disabled, to be able to create these inclusive communities in any way that you can, and to be aware of how these communities operate and who inhabits them. You can find and support inclusive communities. You can recognize disability. Here's an example for uh, that I'm showing an image here of a deaf church congregation using American Sign Language. Almost any community or institution has a population of people with disabilities and often a diversity, equity, and inclusion branch or institutional structure, be aware of that, all of us, and realize that regardless of our uh, relationship with disability, it is our responsibility and opportunity to support disability culture and communities and to connect with disability organizations. There are many organizations everywhere uh, that can be, uh, we can all participate in. I'm showing here a picture of my colleague, uh, Josh Mila, who just won a prestigious MacArthur Award. Um, and he uh, is involved in an outfit in San Francisco called Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And I always like to show an image of Lighthouse because their slogan is, we are the blind leading the blind and proud of it. So, if we work together to increase disability inclusion, 
I want to suggest that that can change attitudes, it can increase access, it can build community, and it can cultivate leadership. And I will leave you with that and say thank you very much, my audience. <laughs>